So this is providing services to male sexual um, violence survivors, part one. And my name is Lachey Brown. I use she and her pronouns, and I am one of two of the sexual violence response coordinators at the Arizona Coalition on Sexual Domestic Violence. And I've been in this position for about a year now. Just a little bit more background information about me. I have experience in crisis response and in sexual and domestic violence advocacy. And then I have some personal experience being a part of a campus CERT. Here are our objectives for today. First, we're going to understand the root causes of sexual violence. Then we're gonna identify the prevalence and dynamics of male sexual violence. After that, we will discuss the relationship between masculinity, gender roles, and men. And then lastly for today, we will examine the barriers men face when disclosing sexual assault. And because this is a two-part webinar, we will have different objectives for tomorrow. Okay, so now we are going to go to our Metameter. And so if you um, were looking at your email that you received for this training, you will need a smartphone for this activity. Um, and if you don't participate, don't worry, it's not gonna affect your certificate or anything like that, but just so it's as interactive as possible. So, this should be the first Mentimeter question you see. So what you all need to do to participate is go to www menti m e n t i dot com and then type in the code 82 13 48 so again you go to www dot menti dot com and then you type in the code 82 13 40. and so all you have to do is answer the questions and then we will um, talk about them a little bit so the first question is how often have you or have you worked with male survivors? And again, this is very anonymous, so you can put your honest answer, I'm not gonna know. And it's really cool to see how much experience we have on the call today, so. And so I see we have 115 people who are logged on for the webinar and we only have 40 people participating. So I would, I'm gonna wait a little bit just to see if folks are thinking about the question um, and hopefully we can get about 70 responses. Okay, so keep putting in your responses. That's perfectly fine. Thank you all for participating. Um, so it looks like about a little, about 65% of us have worked with male survivors a few times. And then the next highest category is that some of us have never worked with male survivors. And that's okay. We just want to see where all of our experiences are coming in. So here's the second question, and these are scaled questions. Um, so all you have to do is move the scale on your screen to according to how comfortable you are. So at the very left side of the screen is not comfortable at all, and at the very right is uh, the most comfortable you could be. So go ahead and put in your response, and you will see the scale moves um, to the average of the whole group of folks who participate. So the first question is, how comfortable are you asking and talking about sexual violence with men? How comfortable are you explaining the forensic exam process to a male survivor? How comfortable are you educating men about the long term, about long term healing? And lastly, how comfortable are you talking about SV services in the community?
Okay, so it looks like our results have kind of tapered off. So it seems like um, as an average, we're all pretty comfortable with talking about sexual violence with men, um, but we're a little less comfortable talking about the forensic exam process. And we do have a training about sexual violence response. So if you want to know, learn more about that, please check out that training. Um, it also looks like we're pretty comfortable about 7.8 about educating men about long term healing, which is good. We definitely need folks who are educated on different healing modalities. And then it also looks like where we're the most comfortable is about talking about sexual violence services in the community. And overall, we got a 7.7 .7 for comfortability. So it looks like folks are pretty comfortable serving men, which is good. What are your concerns about working with male survivors? And this is a word cloud, so you can type in one word, a couple of words, and the more people that say the same word, uh, the bigger that word will get. And you can enter your answers as many times as you would like. What are your concerns about working with male survivors? Okay, so toxic masculinity and shame seem to be really big ones, which makes sense. Uh, we know from men, and we'll really get into this um, through the meat of the training, men, there's a lot of shame around sexual violence, especially when it comes to serving male survivors. Um, embarrassment, openness, um, wording, definitely. Masculinity, um, not being male, yeah. It's kind of hard to sometimes relate to folks that might not share our, our same identities. Guilt, thank you, you all are giving great answers. Um, and keep putting them in if you would like. Um, and if there's an ask for it, um, I can also send this out, these results out when I send out the, um, the slides for this training. Okay, and our last question. What are the biggest gaps you see in services for male survivors? Okay, so the biggest thing we see as a gap is the resources, and I'm guessing that's lack of support groups and lack of support. Um, there's a lack of research, definitely shame um, groups, um, shelters, services, housing, definitely. So thank you, everybody. Um, so that is the end of the Mentimeter. Um, thank you so much for participating. Um, and like I said, if you all would like it, I can send it out with the slides, the PDF of the slides. Okay. 
So now we're going to talk about the prevalence and dynamics of male sexual violence. So if you've been to any of the ACES DV trainings before, um, you will see that you've seen the slide. So we talk about sexual violence and we explain sexual violence as an umbrella term that describes any type of unwanted sexual conduct that occurs without consent. And I'm going to go through a brief explanation of some of these. So rape is a legal term that's used federally, so we don't tend to use it a lot when we're talking about sexual violence. But in most cases, it involves being penetrated and doesn't necessarily count when a person is being made to penetrate someone else, which is why we included that term on the slide as well. And this can be with a body part or another object. So in general, when you hear us talk about sexual violence and we're talking about contact sexual violence, which can include things like kissing, groping, and grabbing without someone's consent, um, we will use the term sexual assault to cover the whole range of those behaviors. Non-contact behaviors are things like voyeurism, exhibitionism, um, sexual threats or unwanted comments, um, also sexual harassment or street harassment, which most of us know as catcalling. And so I just want to challenge this group to remember that just because something isn't aggressive or doesn't cause physical harm to a person, that doesn't mean that interaction wasn't violent, and it also doesn't mean that it wasn't harmful. And then lastly, I wanted to highlight that sexual coercion um, is a tool or a tactic that's used to perpetrate other types of sexual violence um, as opposed to all the other terms in the slide. Okay. I'm just checking the chat briefly because I saw a lot of people were um, doing, putting things in the chat. And I'm sorry if I didn't explain the Mentimeter well enough. Um, I will make sure I do that next time. Um, but going back to the training, um, so sexual violence, just like sexual violence can be a range of different behaviors, it can also happen over the range of a lifetime. So let's take a look at Akiro's life. So Akiro was sexually abused as a child by his troop leader. He was then sexually assaulted twice while attending university. After that, Akiro was sexually harassed in his 40s by his parole officer. But he didn't talk about any of these sexual violence experiences with his partner until the end of his life. So we as responders have to consider that even though a person might be just be disclosing to us that they are a survivor, sexual violence could have taken place at any point in their lifetime. And that they might have had hours or days or even minutes to process what's happened to them. So this could affect their healing journey as well as the resources they need. You also might be pretty familiar with this slide, um, but we just wanna make sure that everyone has the same base knowledge and foundation. What is the root cause of sexual violence? If you know what I'm gonna say, you can go ahead and put that answer in the chat. Um, what is the root cause of sexual violence? Yeah, um, so some of you have got it, but the root cause of sexual violence, we feel, is power. Um, but there can also be a sexual component in it too. So for some people, it could be about sexual desire, but at the end of the day, it's really about that power piece. It's about using your power over someone else or taking someone else's power away. Um, so one example that I use is that there was this woman and she, when she was in Europe, she used to hang out by the Stalin every day and that she noticed that she was getting catcalled. Um, and so one day she decided to respond to the people who were catcalling her. And so they would say things like, hey baby, come over here, I want to give you a kiss, blase, blase. And so she just responded, okay. And then she went over and started talking to these people. And what she found out is that when she approached them, um, many of them no longer wanted to engage with her and some of them even apologized and said that they were sorry. Um, so when she started to take her own power back, they no longer wanted to engage with her because they felt like they had power to make her feel fearful, fearful or ashamed. Um, but once she started taking that power back, then it no longer happened. 
And um, if there's any questions, um, thank you all for using all the different functions we have in Zoom, but I really appreciate it if you put it in the question and answer box. And yeah, it definitely can be dangerous, um, but she felt empowered enough and she felt safe enough where she was. Um, I also should mention that it was daylight to do that. So yeah, de definitely. So power, and at the root of power is oppression. So when we talk of also about sexual violence perpetration and power and oppression, we also have to talk about why survivors might be targeted. Um, so most survivors are targeted by those who cause harm because they're perceived to fall into one or more of these groups. So they're perceived to be highly accessible, highly vulnerable, and have low levels of credibility. So when we think about people who might fall into these groups, who would be seen at these intersections? So which types of people or which, or which person would be seen as highly accessible, highly vulnerable, and have low levels of credibility? And go ahead and put your answers in the chat box. And I will be reading them out. Or what, another way to ask this question is what type, what communities would be in some of these intersections or in the middle? So I see, oh, you all are really getting it. Thank you. Um, so children, homeless folks, um, elderly, definitely older adults, women of color, LGBTQ plus people, people with disabilities, um, poor people, yes, young people, younger individuals. Um, Elderly, disabled, kids, definitely sex workers, thank you. Um, specifically trans folks, yes, definitely. Um, those without family support, mm -hmm, exactly. Those in jail, those living with HIV, oh, that's a good example. Um, Edward, people of color, minorities, um, those who are orphans or those who are using substances, definitely those who are undocumented. Thank you, you all got a lot of these different ones. Um, Let's see. Okay, um, and those who are loners. Yeah, so definitely you all named a lot of different groups. Um, and we still didn't get an inclusive list of everyone who could be in this group, but I just wanted to call out um, specifically um, undocumented men, trans survivors, those with disabilities, um, youth in detention facilities, especially um, adults who are incarcerated and older adults and also sex workers. So again, um, we have to think about how each of these groups will be part of groups that be considered marginalized or disenfranchised. So we will have to reflect about this. In our programs, how are we reaching these different folks? And how are we assisting these people who have these different intersecting identities? I'm sorry if y'all heard that very rude truck in the background. Okay, I think I see some questions and answers. Oh, okay. Great. And so when we're thinking about these people, many of uh, many of these men never receive services. So one in six men have experienced contact sexual violence, and one in eight men have experienced non-contact sexual violence. In Arizona, one in five men have experienced contact sexual violence, so this is higher than the national average. 10% of men in the US have experienced rape, physical violence, and or stalking by a partner, and 52% of male survivors of sexual assault are um, report being raped by an acquaintance, and 15% of male survivors report being raped by a stranger. So we can see that a person, and specifically men, are much more likely to experience sexual violence by the hands of someone known to them. And this can be very harmful for folks and it might be another reason why they don't want to disclose sexual violence. 
When it comes to boys and teens, one in six boys have been sexually abused, and of those boys, one in four um, have been raped by age 10. And when the Department of Justice did some research, they found that a male's greatest risk of being sexually assaulted is at age four, and they're most likely to become victims of sex trafficking between the ages of 11 and 13. Black and brown men are victimized at higher rates than white men. And this fact is really important because it dispels some of those really popular rape myths about who exactly perpetrates sexual violence. Often when we think about perpetrators or those who cause harm, um, Black, Indigenous, and other men of color are stereotyped to be violent, aggressive harm doers, when the data actually finds that they're more likely to be victims of sexual violence. And just so we all have the same idea, all men can be survivors of sexual violence, but not all men are victimized at the same rates. <clears throat> and people with disabilities are some of the most impacted of all populations who experience sexual violence. So people with disabilities are three times more likely to experience sexual violence than people without disabilities. And then people with intellectual and developmental disabilities experience sexual violence at seven times a higher rate than people without disabilities. But why is this? What are some of those reasons? Well, people with disabilities are often seen as less than a person, right? They're seen as less credible, less intelligent, and less vulnerable and less valuable to society. And with that mindset, it's easier to perpetrate against someone you view as quote unquote less than than you. Additionally, people with disabilities are often also seen as unreliable reports and less credible witnesses. So if we go back to that chart a couple slides ago with the three circles, just people with disabilities are often in that very center intersection. And this is a quote from a survivor when he was asked why um, people with disabilities are targeted more. He said, we're taught to trust grown-ups more than anyone else would be. Because when you have a disability, people are always telling you, do as that person says, do as this person says. So again, um, that choice and who has that power. We also know that folks with disabilities are often more segregated and isolated and sexual violence thrives in that isolation. So we have to think about that too. And so when we're serving men, we're also talking about a lot of survivors who could possibly have physical, mental, cognitive, and intellectual disabilities. And we need to think about that into consideration when we're providing services. In the gay, bisexual, trans, and queer community, two in five gay men have experienced sexual violence in their lifetime, and one in two bisexual men have experienced sexual violence. This is particularly important, again, because it dispels another popular myth about sexual violence perpetration. Bi men especially have some of the highest rates of sexual violence victimization, and gay men also have higher rates of sexual violence than experience, excuse me, higher rates of sexual violence than heterosexual men. Fifty-five percent of non-binary people experience sexual violence in their lifetime, and fifty-one percent of trans men have experienced sexual violence in their lifetime. So again, we have to think about whose lives are at the intersections and who is more likely to be victimized. I specifically wanted to highlight and uplift some of these stats because sexual violence is often a direct cause of homelessness for youth, and because houseless folks are also known as people experiencing homelessness. Um, are at a significant higher risk of sexual violence than other people in society. So we have to take into consideration all the identities a person might hold when we're offering them services. 16% of boys report sexual abuse as being a reason for money away from home. 27% of men and 38% of trans people reported either physical or sexual violence within the last year. And then 14% of homeless men will be raped in their lifetime. And sexual violence um, rates are also high in the payment settings. So one in 20 people are sexually assaulted in prison, and one in eight, one in eight youth were sexually assaulted in prison. Um, so we have to think about some of the reasons why that might be as well. 
the PREA did not come into effect until, and PREA, for those who don't know, is the Prison Rape Elimination Act. Um, it didn't come into effect until 2003, and the first report didn't come out until 2009. And there's a lot of different reasons why people in prison um, may not be disclosing sexual assault, but one of the main reasons is that they would have to often disclose the sexual assault they're experiencing to the people who are responsible to carry on their reports, right? So that might be a barrier for those folks. So in the end, it, we really have to think about who's perceived to be perpetrators of sexual violence and against the actual data about who are the survivors of sexual violence. Um, and if we're not doing outreach and serving those in detention settings, then we really can't say that we're serving everyone. But these high levels of sexual violence, and many of which go unreported, are influenced by gender and masculinity. Um, so I'm going to stop now just to go ahead and check our chat box. Okay, yeah, people are definitely, I think, resonating with um, the quote from that man with the disability um, who was talking about um, choice. Definitely. So, okay. So please answer this question in the chat box. Again, I'm going to keep you all, um, it's going to be a discussion as much as possible. So what does it mean to be a boy? Please put your answer in the chat box. Um, what are some of the behaviors that are attributed to boys or some of the characteristics and attributes attributed to being a man. So if you had to describe what a boy was to someone who never um, heard of a boy, how would you describe them? You don't have to be, you have to be tough, don't cry, don't show emotions, strong, energetic, rough and tumble tough, rough and tumble, no emotion, aggressive, manly, not a punk, hard, learn how to, to come to be a man, right? Um, not to show emotions, bury their feelings, unless they're emotional, it's toughness, tough, don't be scared, strong, someone who's brave, Short hair, breadwinner, you're strong, you're in charge, dirty, messy. You all are getting it. Keep rolling these answers in. Um, but you all got the majority of what we were thinking. For us, we, we said what it means to be a boy. Um, boys are taught that they need to be aggressive, independent, strong, dominant, active. They're not nurturing. They're very worldly. They're decisive. Um, they're unemotional. They always think about sex. They're intelligent. They take charge. Um, they're experts, they're hands-on things, and they're action-oriented and problem solvers. And what we also learned is that it's pretty much the opposite of what is thought um, when we ask the question, what does it mean to be a girl? Girls are taught that they're supposed to be non-aggressive, collaborative, dependent, weak and naive, submissive, passive, nurturing, home-oriented, indecisive, emotional, never to think about sex, Ditsy, um, need to be protected, and unsafe. But we know that's not true for all people, even people who identify this way. I know a lot of men who are very passive and they are very harm oriented and I know a lot of women who are very independent and problem solvers, right? But in our society, because there's such a dichotomy or such a gender binary um, that tells us that these genders are opposite of each other and that they're very polarized, it doesn't allow room for any other things to exist. Even though in reality that we know there's room for overlap and there are other genders. Additionally, when we're talking about these gender attributes or these gender roles, um, they're often white gender roles and other races and ethnicities and cultures are required to conform to these. So let's frame this a little bit. So um, your best friend has just told you um, who's been trying to get pregnant that they want to have a baby. Yay, congratulations, we're so happy for you. But even often the first question we ask, even before we ask about if the pregnancy is healthy, if everything's going okay, is about the gender. 
right? And we even base the child's name and even some of their attributes, attributes um, around that gender. And often it's so we can know things about them. Um, and not only their name, but also the gifts that we get them are also guided by gender. So we can see that even before a child is born, society and gender are influencing them. So if uh, you all could put this, your answers in the chat box here too, what is this a picture on the right of? If you've ever seen this or something like this, what is this picture? Yes, you all got it. So it's a gender reveal. Um, yeah, so this is a gender reveal. And so we can see that oftentimes the experiences of a child starts in an event like this picture, right? Even before the baby's even born. Um, and it determines, like I said, some of the gifts we buy for boys, we buy them trucks, we buy them footballs, we buy them other sports things. Um, as you can see, that was still a very gender response for me because I don't know a lot of sports things. Um, but for girls, we buy things with a lot of glitter and flowers and sunshine and lots of things that talk about how sweet they are. Um, so even before that child is born, even before that child knows their likes and dislikes, um, our culture is influencing that and their personality and even some of their behaviors. But this isn't a fixed structure. So in, um, in times past, when we were talking about boys, um, the color actually associated with them was pink because of blood and girls and blue was actually thought to be a girl color because it was associated with calm and with water. So again, this changes with time, but it's still a very rigid structure. Um, and because we talked about how rigid that structure it is, how does that frame our expectations for boys and girls? So uh, from a very young age, we're telling boys and girls very different things, right? We already just talked about the different attributes attributed to each gender, but we can see them pretty easily when it comes to the types of clothing. So from a very young age, we're telling girls that they have to be soft and, pa and passive and focus on their appearance, but what are we telling boys? From a young age, boys are taught to focus on being strong, which some of you really identify with, with being aggressive and on attracting women. So if we look a little closer at some of these shirts, we see that even before our baby knows what the, its sexuality is, it's being reinforced that being heterosexual is a good thing. And we know that in infancy, babies are too young to know their sexuality, but it's still seen that being heterosexual is preferred. But again, right, Lachey, you're looking too deep into some of these things. Like, that's just the way things are. Um, and these are still just babies, right? These, shir these shirts and these outfits are seen as normal, cute, and as jokes. Let's look at boyhood now. Um, so we see that when kids are boys um, and when at a young age, we see that violence and aggression start to be encouraged. And even if it's in a controlled outlet like sports. We also see that during this time, this is where we see fighting and roughhousing or horsing around is seen as just a normal part of childhood. And this is also around the time a child starts going to school and starts socializing with people outside of their family. And also when we start to see children developing crushes and boys are told that it's a normal part to just to tease girls and to bully them and all around really treat girls badly to get their attention. But still, you know, it's just seen as something that's adorable. It's played off as just puppy love, um, and it will eventually stop. And so we can kind of see that it's still it's aggressive, right? But it's still seen as cute, funny, and still pretty normal. Let's move into our teen years now. Um, so we can see that many of the outlets that target teen boys, such as video games also focus on things like aggression, strength, and violence. But even with that, it's a progression, right? It starts with things such as monsters that spit out points as you jump on their heads, like Mario, the killing monsters and zombies, to eventually attacking everyday people, and they increasingly get more violent and descriptive with age. 
Social media also has a huge part in play to play in this. Um, so what's normalized as a normal quote unquote teen boy experience is someone who's seen as the it guy. Um, they're incredibly buff. They don't show a lot of emotion. They get a lot of attention from their female romantic partners and often treat them badly for what's called clout or for approval from their followers. And they have money and status. In their teen years, this is also around the time where we see boys start to be exposed to porn. Um, so the American Psychological Association found that the average person's age to be first exposed to porn is 13, with the earliest exposure being at age five. But that isn't to say that we at the coalition are anti-porn. Um, actually, we are for at healthy porn, um, but most of the porn that boys this age have access to isn't that healthy porn, right? It doesn't focus on consent and healthy pleasure. It focuses on consent and healthy pleasure. And um, this unhealthy porn is what boys are measuring their sexual experience, experiences against. So now in society's eyes, boys have lost most of their cute factor, but it's still seen as pretty acceptable and laughable to be violent, aggressive. And now we directly acknowledge um, that it's okay to sexualize women. And then finally, we reach adulthood. Now stories like this are still seen as pretty funny and comical, right? Um, and in doubt whip it out and we know that if you expose your genitals to someone then that is sexual violence and we also see blow me it's my birthday right so the expectation that someone owes you because it is the day of your birth and we'll really get into some of the examples that men take but let's look at this man's costume um, so I'm not going to read the front, but I will focus on the back, and it says, because I know it's a little dark, I'll read it to everybody, it says, caution, no more than 15 guys per girl, exceeding 165 pounds recommended doses for tablets or more, not for use near video equipment, no means yes, and this guy is dressed up as Rufinol, and for those of you who don't know, Rufinol is a very popular um, drug, a rape, a rape rate drug, um, also known as Rufies. And this costume is homemade, so it isn't like this person um, just ordered this costume and had no idea and was horrified by its portrayal. He actively chose to wear this costume. And he felt comfortable and secure enough to make a joke about sexual violence that a lot of people feel comfortable disclosing. But we really saw how these behaviors and ideas grew and progressed throughout the lifespan and into adulthood, right? People don't just start off thinking and internalizing that rape jokes are funny or that violence and aggression are okay. That's actually a result of rape culture. But what is rape culture? Rape culture is a culture in which sexual violence is tolerated, accepted, and minimalized. And this sounds, looks, and feels different ways for different communities. And similar to how we're all a part of different cultures and subcultures, our cultures and ideals have been changed by rape culture. And rape culture is ingrained in so many things, sometimes it's really hard to recognize it on the surface. And a lot of the things that we think of as normal, especially language, are coded in racism, misogyny, and in rape culture. And we've kind of already talked about that even before birth, women and men are socialized in very different ways, and these paths are, are often opposite of each other. And we have a whole training that really is dedicated to talking about those pathways, um, and it's called Sexual Violence and Oppression. So if you want to learn more about that, please check out that training. But these paths don't only tell people how they should act and what they should like and what they should do, it also tells them what to value as well. For women, they're taught to value their appearance, their appearance, and that leads to the objectification and unhealthy sexualization of women. For men, they're thought to they're taught to value strength, power, and status, and they're often socialized and taught throughout their lives to value this above all else. And that can be very harmful and hurtful, as we just saw in some of those examples. And when this need and lust for strength, for power and status are made the primary objective in a man's life, this leads to toxic masculinity. 
Toxic masculinity is a really narrow definition of masculinity that focuses on having power over others, strength, and being aggressive in a way that eventually leads to violence. So a good example of this archetype is who we would think of as the general alpha male. Um, when we picture who that is, this person's aggressive, he's very loyal to his social group, especially his male peers and role models, but still he wants to dominate them and others. He also wants to have his needs and wants met without being questioned. And when he feels inadequate, he responds with aggression. Toxic masculinity teaches boys and men not to be emasculated, and if they are, it's a significant threat to their manhood. To suppress their emotions except for anger and limited pleasure. That solving problems with violence is the quickest and only way to really solve problems. That to become a man, you have to fulfill different tasks, often centered around being embarrassed or sex and to objectify women and use predatory behavior to achieve sex. Overall, it really limits the definition of what a real man, quote unquote, can be. And while that affects men who perpetrate sexual violence and men who are sexual violence survivors differently, toxic masculinity is harmful to everyone, including men. But when we're talking about these different gender roles, um, American gender roles specifically are couched in heterosexuality and whiteness, and all other identities, backgrounds, and cultures are measured against these, these very defined and specific roles, but they can never truly achieve this status. Um, so again, I'm going to ask you all a question. Do you all know who this person is on the slide um, picture to the right? Yeah, so some of you are familiar with this person. This is Terry Crews, um, and he is also a sexual violence survivor, and he has spoken extensively about his experience as a survivor and how he was very conscious um, when the violence was happening about how he was going to be perceived as a very large black man fighting a smaller white man. And so we really have to think about when we're talking about things like masculinity, like talks and masculinity, like gender roles, um, which men are allowed to solve these problems with violence and which men are stereotyped to be violent? And what are the consequences for men who are not the dominant group? So if they're not able-bodied, cisgendered, heterosexual white men, and how does that affect them? And so I have a poll question for you all, and I'm gonna try to pull it up right now. Um, so again, this poll question is anon this is anonymous, so I won't see your, your answers, but the poll is launching now. Do we live in a culture that encourages toxic masculinity? And if you don't think so, that's perfectly fine. You don't have to you don't have to think that. This is a safe space and you can say, I'm exactly what you're thinking. So only about 48% of us have voted. Um, so I'm gonna try to wait and see if we can reach that 90%. Do we live in a culture that encourages toxic masculinity? all have questions um again thank you for using all the zoom functions um but if you have questions please use the question answer box so i can check that um yes and some of folks are saying their answers in the chat box i got a couple yeses and we're at 66 percent it looks like it slowed down so the majority of folks said they think we did um one person said no and some folks are unsure and that's okay that's what we're at the training here to talk about So let's just go through a couple of examples. So let's say we're hungry, you know, everybody gets hungry and we wanna just go get some food. 
even when it comes to food, so we have man witches here, which we know are sloppy joes, and we have a hungry man, which is um, a, a ready to eat freeze dinner. Um, even when it comes to food, unconsciously, we're taught that the man version is somehow a little bit better because it's stronger, it's packed with more flavor and more filling because it's manly. When really this food is exactly the same as any other um, type of food out there. Um, and there's going to be another question here, so put your answers in the chat box when you see it. What do you all see in this picture? Um, who's in this picture? What are they doing? And what are they? What do they look like? Okay, so some folks said boys with guns and swords, hunting, kids playing with guns and swords, kids playing, guns and swords, they all have weapons, boys playing, kids with guns and swords, the boys are in control, guns, three kids playing, boys with guns and swords, kids with toys, weapons. Um, desensitizing boys to weapons, mm, okay. So yeah, you all can keep putting your answers in the chat. But you, most of us got it right, right? You can see boys of various ages here. And it looks like they're playing pretend, right? One's dressed in a Batman cowl. Um, but they're all holding weapons, right? And we know, and when, with our definition of toxic masculinity, that toxic masculinity encourages violence, right? And that's the point of having a weapon, it's violence. Um, but we have to also remember that we have to think and frame who is allowed to be violent and who's criminalized for doing the same actions. Right, um, so I don't think anyone said this, but these are all three white boys in the picture. Um, and this here is a picture of Tamir Rice. Um, Tamir Rice was also a boy, but he was 12 years old when he was playing with a toy gun and he was shot dead by law enforcement. So we have to really think about who's portrayed to be a child, who's thought to be um, a harm doer or those who cause harm and who's not as well. All right, so let's say we're on the internet, we wanna do a workout routine, right? So in our first video, we see there's a, a still of a video called Gym Motivation, Stop Being a Pussy. And this one is, um, we can see it's still pretty popular because it got 800,000 views. Um, we also talked a little bit earlier about some examples of toxic masculinity in clothing, but on this example of underwear, it's simultaneously telling folks that they're, it's not good to be a woman while also hypersexualizing them. And another toxic theme that's presented in movies is the rituals of manhood, specifically about losing your virginity. Um, so we, so a lot of folks have seen these two movies right here, um, but not as many folks, I don't think. Um, if you have, please let me know, seeing this movie, this third movie right here. Um, so some of these first two movies are really seen as funny, as hilarious, and as staples um, when it comes to comedic movies, and the other one isn't really. We have, so we have to think about, um, we're talking about these different oppressions, um, how sexism and racism often overlap. But again, still in the context of what's seen as a normal part of masculinity. Okay, and now we have an ad. So we're gonna watch it right now. Mediocre Films 2. So we've seen this ad um, and we saw a focus on this guy really getting what he wants by just eating some Doritos. And I think that would be a great life to have, 
But what some of the things that he wanted was lots of money. And he also, um, we also saw when he ate the Dorito that this woman's clothes immediately came off, right? And we didn't see him asking her if she wanted to take her clothes off, if she was comfortable with that. So again, um, we see that there is this, um, this focus on achieving power and achieving status, but also sexualizing women. Toxic masculinity um, also teaches men that when they feel emasculated or disrespected, they have to react with violence or aggression, especially when that perceived disrespect comes in reform from rejection from a woman. Now, Andrea Farrington, which is the headline in the middle, um, she was shot and killed at Victoria, who is one of our other, our other sexual violence response coordinators, um, favorite childhood mall, so where she's from. Uh, she was sexually harassed, Andrea was sexually harassed repeatedly by a security guard there and was shot after she rejected him multiple times and she used the I have a boyfriend excuse and then he, she reported him and he was that and then he was then fired. So more often than not when we see stories like this, um, these are seen as one-offs of extreme violence. It doesn't happen all the time when in reality it happens a lot more frequently than many of us think. Toxic masculinity and rape culture also tell us who gets to talk about sexual assault and who gets to be a victim. So I took these screenshots pretty frequently and that's why I love doing Google searches because it kind of shows us what, um, what is the ideal of whatever you're looking for. Um, and so in the first picture where it says sexual assault, when I type that in, we see a majority of the pictures were women and we see some different skin tones. But we only see a man in the picture in the context after we talked about women. In the second picture, when I typed in sexual assault victim, we still see a majority of white women hiding their faces. And while there is a little bit more age diversity in this search, there's still no men in sight. So we really have to reflect on in our society who's seen as a survivor of sexual assault and who's perceived to always be the victim. And when men are survivors of sexual violence, um, they're often, and when they disclose, they're often seen or viewed as a joke or as or the sexual violence against them is seen as a punishment. So some of these people on the slide and some of these are like memes and news headline coverings, um, but some of the people on the slide are harm viewers and have perpetrated sexual violence. However, it's really important that we all understand and are perfectly clear about sexual violence not being a part of someone's prescribed payment sentence, and sexual violence should not at any point be used as punishment. But still, when it's talked about, it's seen as something that's funny or something that's laughable or something that can just be played off. And one of those other um, aspects of toxic masculinity is um, about those initiations into manhood, and one of them is hazing. Um, so this top picture is actually a, not a not a real life picture. It's a still from Law and Order SVU, but oftentimes we can see that hazing is an element of both sexual violence and shame as a part of these different rituals. Um, so this headline right here is um, talking about a football uh, town in Texas. And once boys made the varsity team, um, they one of their the rituals that they had was annually raping them. Um, so we can often see that it's it's really not only that embarrassment factor, but also it's rooted in sexual violence. And so now we're gonna watch another video. This episode comes with a very strong content warning for frank discussions of and media clips involving rape and sexual harassment. There's a surprisingly disturbing a lot of mass media entertainment, 
a trend that often flies under the radar. Let me explain. You're watching a popular TV show or movie, laughing along at the hijinks, when suddenly things take a jarring turn. Check out the news. I'm going to slather you up in Navi and Jelly. <laughs> Go to town. Wait a minute. Was that a rape joke? <laughs> I'm going to slather you up in Navi and Jelly. <laughs> Go to town. Yep, certainly was. This one here is our booty. Maybe it's just an anomaly. This doesn't end with us riding into the sunset. It ends with me dying of cancer and you winning the Icebox Award for softest mouth. Hold up. That's another rape joke, in another superhero blockbuster. Let's try something else. Don't drop the soap, big homie. <laughs> Ugh. Where will you be watching the world consume me from? That's right. A prison cell. I'll send you a bar of soap. How about we try a comedy instead? Relax and open wide. Wait, wait, what are you doing? Oh, dude! That went on my ass! Yikes. <laughs> Let's switch to a TV show. As soon as you drop the soap, they rape your butt. That's what happens. Ah! Ah! No! Stop! I'm saying no! Uh, Bieber was uh, briefly jailed early this morning. He went to jail early this morning, and the police report described him as five foot nine and 140 pounds. Or as his soulmate put it, just right. <laughs> You've likely noticed the pattern here. In each case, sexual assault is played for laughs, and in each case, the targets of the joke are men. You know, uh, he's like a bite-sized yeah. Snickers. Yeah. Fun size. Okay, sorry everybody, I lost my place really quickly. Um. Okay, so even in that one, we can see, oops. There we go. Okay, so even on that one, we can see that rape culture and when it comes to sexual violence against men is largely still just seen as a joke, even when it's, it's, it's aggressive, it's violent, and there's no doubt that sexual assault happened, it's still seen as something that's funny and laughable. And we saw that men are often blamed for their victimization um, and something that's not seen as not serious and as a joke. Um, even though these different aspects of, se of toxic masculinity are harmful all on their own, when they are compounded, they really cause a lot of damage and a lot of harm. Um, and toxic masculinity says that you have to be, be, again, tough and aggressive. You have to assert your power over others. You have to always be ready to have sex, even if you don't want to. You have to always be control, which means that you can never be a victim. And if you are a victim, then you aren't really a man. And that's a really harmful thought for survivors to live with, especially for male survivors. And we're gonna watch another video. Stop crying. Stop with the tears. Don't cry. Pick yourself up. Stop with the emotions. Don't be a pussy. Don't let nobody disrespect you. Be cool and be kind of a dick. Always keep your mind Nobody shut. likes a tattletale. Bros come before hoes. Don't let you women run your you life. You bitch. What a fag. Get laid. Do something. Be a man. Be a man. Grow some balls. The three most destructive words that every man receives when he's a boy is when he's told to be a man. 
we've constructed an idea of masculinity in the United States that doesn't give young boys a way to feel secure in their masculinity. So we make them go prove it all the time. Within their peer group culture, each of them is posturing based on how the other boys are posturing. And what they end up missing is what they each really want, which is just that closeness. In good times, guys are like really close to each other. But when things get a little bit worse, you're on your own. From middle school, I had four really close friends. But once I kind of went into high school, I struggle finding people I can talk to because I feel like I'm not supposed to get help. Our kids get up every morning. They have to prepare their mask for how they're going to walk to school. A lot of our students don't know how to take the mask off. What is it you don't let people see? Almost 90% of you have pain and anger on the back of that paper. If you never cry, then you have all these feelings stuffed up inside of you, and then you can't get them out. They really buy into the, a culture that doesn't value what we've feminized. If we're in a culture that doesn't value caring, doesn't value relationships, doesn't value empathy, you are going to have boys and girls, men and women, go crazy. I had anger issues in high school. I felt like an outcast. I've been suspended at least once every year I was here. We would just look for trouble and just like try to fight. Boys are more likely to act out. They're more likely to become aggressive. Most people miss that as depression or see it as a conduct disorder or just a bad kid. I felt like just giving up on life. You know, I actually had suicide thought to my head at sixth grade. I felt alone for, for a long time. And I actually thought about killing myself. Whether it's homicidal violence or suicidal violence, People resort to such desperate behavior only when they are feeling shamed and humiliated or feel they would be if they didn't prove that they were real men. If you're told from day one, don't let nobody disrespect you, and this is the way you handle it as a man, respect is linked to violence. If I can man up, why well, step down from that, you feel me? It's like instinct. So man up! Man up! Man Act like a man. Be a man. Be a man. For my kids, I was going to end this hyper masculine narrative here. So, that is a trailer um, for the documentary The Masculine Women, and I would highly suggest you all check it out. It's a great documentary that talks about masculinity. Okay. So we are now going to do a couple of more. We're going to go into the perceptions of violence, and there are going to be a couple more poll questions, um, and they're going to be a series of true or false questions. So I will um, pull them up, and then you, all you will all have to do is answer these questions in the poll, in the, in the poll um, that I bring up. So the first true or false question is that most sexual abuse of boys is perpetrated by gay men. And I will bring it up right now. Oh, okay. All right. So the, we're just on the first one, so just worry about doing the first one right now, and then we'll move on to the second one. So most sexual abuse of boys is perpetrated by gay men. Is that true or false? So, okay. So just focus on the first question right now. I know they're all on one, um, but just focus on the first question. Okay, so it looks like only 16 folks have responded. Um, so we still have got about 100 folks participating. So. I'm hoping for a little bit more participation. Oh, you can't submit it without answering the other questions. Thank you, Maria. That is very good information to know. Um, so go ahead and submit to all of them and we'll just go through them. Thank you all for letting me know that. So 
Okay, I'll give it about 30 more seconds and then we'll move on. But it looks like most folks are saying false. And then we got a couple of folks saying true. So I'm going to end the polling and I'm going to share the results with you all. Um, okay, so that is actually a false statement. Um, that is false. So this is an untrue stereotype that perpetuates fear and hatred against the LGBTQ community. Um, like we talked about a little bit earlier, um, more, it's more than likely that gay and bisexual men will be victims of sexual violence rather than um, perpetrators of sexual violence. For the next one, women perpetrate sexual violence against men and boys. Is this true or false? So it looks like most people said true and a couple of other people said this was a myth. Um, so yes, major it looks like majority of us got this one right. So 64 people said yes um nine people said no so this is true women do perpetrate sexual violence against men and boys um so you can read it i just want you all to know where i got this information from but what it really means that um for a majority of contact sexual violence outside of rape um male survivors reported only having female perpetrators and for unwanted non-contact sexual experiences a third of men reported only having female perpetrators so that means that women do perpetrate um sexual violence um against men men are not as affected as women by men are not as affected as women by sexual violence is this true or false So a couple of folks said true. Um, it doesn't look like we're getting any more. Uh, so people are also saying, some people are saying true, some people are saying false in the chat. Okay. Um, and the majority of the poll said this was false and a couple of folks also said true. So this is actually false. Uh, men who experience sexual abuse are, are are also are more likely to experience post-traumatic stress disorder and depression, alcoholism and drug use, suicidal thoughts and suicidal attempts, problems had to have problems in intimate relationships, and um, also have issues with achievements at school and at work. But that difference really is for men, they're less likely to identify the these issues that they have and the traumatic impact of abuse as such. And men are also, that we talked about, aren't permitted to show emotions or ask for help in the same way that women are. Men or boys who are abused by women got lucky. Is this true or false? So a lot of folks um, in the poll we can see said false, um, 66%, and a couple of us said, oh, that's the wrong stat. Excuse me, everybody. Um, so a lot of us said false, 71, 70, 97% of us said false, and a couple of us said true, and a lot of people in the chat are saying false, um, but someone said false, but it's often viewed as true. That is also, a tr that is also true, Adam, thank you for raising that point. Um, that is false, right? But that's not how a lot of people perceive this, right? Especially when it's framed as that teacher student or babysitter and um, the person who's being babysat relationships. Um, we can see how it's viewed as a positive thing and that these men are somehow better or cooler because this happened. Um, but this is an underlying message that shouldn't be the case. Um, if anything happens without someone's consent, that's sexual assault. 
and additionally, children cannot consent to sexual activity. One person from one in six framed it this way. Again, the confusion comes from focusing on the sexual aspect rather than the abusive one, the exploitation and betrayal of a more powerful, trusted, or admired person. In reality, premature, coerced, or otherwise abusive and exploitative sexual experiences are never positive. And then our last question. True or false, male, sexual, male survivors of sexual assault will become perpetrators themselves. we've got a little bit more different answers on this one um which is okay that's what we're at this training to learn about so 82 percent of us said that's false and 11 percent of us said that's true and then um some folks in the chat were saying false not all cases it's case by case we're a random few but not all yeah so i think you all are really are really grabbing it um so in the data finds that most survivors do not go on to sexually assault others. But a lot of survivors, however, are very fearful of this. But the best research out there shows that the vast majority of survivors do not go on to perpetrate themselves. So we as advocates really need to make sure that we have the right tools to affirm survivors and the appropriate referral so they can get the services they, that they need. So all of these different phrases and th are things that we've heard or ideas that are very prevalent in our society. So even though the majority of what we talked about today and these some of these things and ideas that we um, went through for true or false are untrue, uh, many of us have heard some version or some notion of these things. But that's really what rape culture does, right? It allows for these ideas, like some people deserve to be raped, like people who go to prison, or that boys aren't telling the truth when they report rape, or that they're lying, or that rape isn't harmful as truth and as fact. And it really normalizes and perpetuates these different rape myths that we just went through. Rape myths like that we just went over are culturally supported and accurate beliefs that condone the use of sexual violence. And in layman's terms, they are untrue statements that allow sexual violence to continue to take place. But the most prevalent and damaging sexual assault myth amongst responders, so that's amongst us, is that victims aren't telling the truth. Um, and society really would have us to believe that victims are lying, or they're exaggerating, or they're covering something up, or just to hide what they've really done, so they're just quote unquote crying rape. Uh, but if we as responders are holding this as true and believing these things, and letting society's biases influence our thinking, then it's easier for us to engage with victim blaming. And victim blaming is when we place responsibility on the victim um, for the harm caught, for the harm they've suffered through or for the crime that was committed against them. But what does victim blaming sound like? What is it? It looks like, stop whining about it already. I knew there was something wrong with you. Why don't you just push her off? Guys can't get raped. Whatever, dude, you liked it. Isn't that why, is that why you're bisexual? Maybe they were just drunk. If you tell anyone, they're not you're gay. And all of these other different phrases. And victim blaming, especially when it's directed at men, might sound dismissive or like that person that the survivor is disclosing to isn't taking them seriously. And so it's important that we notice when this is happening. And even when we think that we're helping or we're just trying to understand, these statements can still be very um, harmful and they are victim blaming. Cliche, oh, sorry to interrupt. There's the gray box on the screen that's covering up half of the slides. Thank you. Okay. Um, and so when we're talking about victim blaming, uh the news and media are one of the worst um worst offenders of this um for women when it are you talking about victim blaming it really focused on um, what the woman was doing what they were wearing and for men there's usually a uh, direct challenges 
to that person's identity and specifically to their masculinity and whether it's a sexist attempt to add legitimacy to their story or it's an attempt to take away from their attempt to take away from it. So these are all different statements from men who are survivors of sexual violence. Uh, and these, they're standing with the statements that their harm doers said to them. So I'm going to give you all a moment to read through this. So imagine hearing these messages and these victim blaming statements and these rape myths, not only from society, but also from people who care about you and maybe from even from the person that's harming, harming you, right? It might make sense that for survivors, especially male survivors who are taught and conditioned to keep their emotions in, um, to start internalizing some of these messages and it further traumatizes them. And there are very tangible consequences for rape culture and victim blaming. So at the beginning, society discourages people from reporting, and this can be both societal and cultural, and the survivors um, then internalize these messages. Then that person is blamed or not believed. And then from there, that person is less likely to disclose and report in the future because it didn't work out for them the first time. Then they can face additional trauma because of that re-traumatization. So if they're not able to get resources, they're not able to get help, they'll become further traumatized. And from there, if the survivor doesn't receive um, justice within the criminal legal system and or thought is not to be deserving of justice because they're not being believed, then if they're not being believed, there's no justice for the survivor, then um, that person that harmed them is not being held accountable. And from there, sexual violence continues. And so does that pain, so does that trauma, and so does that oppression that comes with it. Um, and just like the illustration on the slide, rape culture and victim blaming continue to spiral, go, grow larger, and affect more people. And so just to make sure we all have the same understanding, rape culture and sexual violence happen because we live in a culture that allows, normalizes, and encourages it to happen without holding people accountable for the harm they've caused. But those are just some of the different barriers survivors might face when it comes to disclosing sexual violence. 80% of male survivors do not report to being sexually assaulted. Um, and this is, actually, this is actually lower than the national average. So nationally, more people actually disclose than simply men do. Another chat question, why do you all think that men and boys specifically do not disclose sexual assault. Yeah, you all are really getting it. So some of the answers that we're seeing are they're embarrassed, um, they're embarrassed, shame, stigma, and they might be afraid, they think they won't be believed, embarrassment, definitely you all are getting them. Thank you so much. Powerless, macho perception, definitely. Shame and guilt, if it was a family member, you all are getting all the major reasons. Thank you so much. Specifically for men, here's some things that we identify. So we know that there's a stigma around victimization. Um, and already in our society, many of us have this unhealthy relationship with sex, right? We're not taught about it. And then gender roles impact how we think about sex. Specifically, we know that boys are taught that they always have to want sex and they can't be a victim. And if they are a victim, then that somehow negates their manhood. This is also this increased isolation when it comes to this whole thing that they might lose um, their, some of their family support or their support systems. There's also these societal concepts of what sexual, sexual violence is. 
Um, so we know that certifically for male survivors, um, how they're made fun of or made light of or how when we talk about sexual violence and who survivors are, men are not included in that definition. Um, there's also unhealthy sex sexuality, right? So we're, we're just not comfortable talking about sex. So we also in society really aren't comfortable talking about sexual violence and that re-traumatization piece. And then when it comes to historical trauma, um, really depending on their cultural background, there could be some mistrust in relying on systems that have harmed their communities in the past for justice and accountability. And then people just also might not think that they are included in some of our systems, right? Um, I think if we all went back to our programs, our agencies, and did an inclusion audit and thought about how we include men in our outreach, in our materials, and in our programs, we would probably find that our content um, does not center men. And then also there's a lack of resources, specifically when we're talking about male, male specific resources. And that lack of resources has a basis, right? Um, when we talk about those societal expectations, we know that society does not think that men are survivors of sexual violence. Um, and from there, most funding structures right now may not focus or, or make room to allow a focus on creating male specific services outside of outreach and a little bit of prevention work. And so from there, if men are not seen as survivors in our society, if they're not seen and included in our funding structures, then there might not be policy and advocacy to support male survivors. And if there isn't any policy to support male survivors, if there's no outreach specifically to men, and if there's no efforts to support this population in these systems or in our policies, the men will continue to be excluded and we will continue to not serve men or male survivors at our full capacity. So just some general questions for us to think about. What services does your agency offer specifically for men? And how do you inform the community that these services are available? The way I was treated after the after was worse than the rape itself. When the survivor said this, he wasn't just talking about responders. He was talking about how he was treated by his family, by his friends, by his coworkers, and people in his community. Um, so this is not to cast blame on any particular responder, but instead to remind us of the critical role that we play in survivors' well-beings, right? So we can either help someone heal or contribute to someone's hurt. And I know that we're all here today and a part of this webinar because we really want to help male survivors. But we have to first acknowledge some of these gaps and be willing to change the way we do our services to do things to serve survivors better. And so that is it for today. So Victoria is going to go ahead and drop the link to the survey in our chat. Again, if you would like to receive a certificate of completion for today's training, you will need to send me a screenshot of the um, of your completed evaluation and my email is right here so you can send it to it. And if you have any questions, now is the time for me to answer them. Thank you all for attending today. So Maria, oh Mariah, I'm sorry, said, we have found it difficult to provide resources to the detained community. What additional resources might be available to this community aside from crisis hotline? Yes, um, so some resources are to just do, to go to these places and actually do outreach to them. So like some places allow outside groups to do support groups. And if you are a domestic and sexual violence agency, we really should be um, offering those services anyway to some of these places, right? Um, because we know that trauma and trauma responses are criminalized. So a lot of survivors are in these places. Um, so it means that we actually have to show up in person to some of these places and do that advocacy. Um, if you want to talk about more resources, um, Mariah, my email is on the slide and I would love to talk about some of these things with you. Any other questions? Okay, well that is it for today. I will, oh, so you do this survey today, and then you will also get another one tomorrow. So there will be two separate surveys. One will say providing services for male sexual assault survivors part one, and the other one will say part two.
no problem everybody so yeah that is the end for today so please let me know if you have any more questions but we are done for today please do the survey 